Um, welcome to the uh, lunchtime lecture series at the Botanical Research Institute of Texas in the Fort Worth Botanic Garden. Um, this is a regular monthly series we do. We've been doing it for some years now. And before I forget, our next uh, planned lecture will be in May when Dr. John Pipoli will be presenting something on the intersection of climate change and public health. So uh, join us for that. We'll be sending out um, news alerts and, and invitations to that via social media. But today, it's my great pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, Ulysses Oles. Um, Am I saying that right? Oles, Oles. Oles. Oles, Oles. I always want it to be two syllables. Um, Ulysses, we discovered him. Uh, he's a gem. We discovered him, what was that, two years ago, 2022, uh, when he applied for a summer internship here and in working in, in near bearing with our torch collection and digitization. Digitization, but we will forever remember him as our Arundo Donax guy, which is a, a giant invasive plant and uh, just happened to push him out of the van on that lovely fateful trip <laughs> coming back from Oklahoma and he made one of the greatest collections we I think we have in our collection um, of this this invasive grass and he taught us some things about it that we didn't already know um, but today Ulysses is going to be talking about his work that he's been doing for his master's degree at TCU just right down the road um, Ulysses has been there for at TCU for his uh, got his bachelor's in biology there and uh, has been working with Dr. Dean Williams, who has been a research associate with uh, Brit in the garden for some time now. Um, Ulysses is, has, is a great student and uh, a favorite of, of ours. He's won several awards, right? Since being at, at TCU, I think last, so last year, you got uh, a Science and Engineering Research Center grant and you got the Adkins Fellowship, which is um, very impressive. So uh, without further ado, though, I'm gonna let him go ahead and tell, tell us all about his master's work. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we can try to start with it set up there. Okay, well, uh, I wanna start off by saying thank you to everybody for having me here and for uh, showing up for this talk. So I'm going to be going over a little bit of background on invasive species in general, and then talking about the work that I've done specifically for my masters uh, with employing a new testing method for identifying fluoridone resistance in Hydra laverta salata. So yeah, here's a little background slide. This is actually a picture taken from the time during that torch internship. Uh, that's me on the roadside collecting my Arundo Donax. Uh, so yeah, got my BA in biology at TCU. I uh, was working on undergrad research with Dr. Williams at that point, uh, primarily with hydrilla as well as alligator weed. Uh, so generally speaking, my educational background focuses on conservation and population genetics, though I'm also a big fan of ecology and evolutionary biology. So a lot of that bleeds into the type of things that I'm interested in working with. Uh, yeah, there's just a little, I spent the summer working on that torch project. Uh, and generally speaking, my research is focused on the genetic drivers of invasive plant success. So essentially looking at why plants are capable of being successful invasive species uh, from a genetic standpoint and potentially trying to figure out how to combat those characteristics. So before I get started, I just want to do like a breakdown of what I mean when I'm talking about invasive plants in general. So what they actually are, uh, when I'm talking about invasives, I mean plants that are introduced from a different range, their native range, to a new environment, and they actually become established in that new environment. So species, plants, animals are introduced all the time to new places, but they don't generally actually become established. They often die off because of different environmental conditions. Uh, they struggle to actually reproduce and generate subsequent generations. Uh, when I talk about established, I mean actually being successful in regards to reproducing. Uh, the reason why plants are generally able to succeed when they enter a new environment or why any species is able to find success on occasion uh, is usually because there's a change in external factors like predation. So maybe predators that bothered them in their native range won't be in the new range, so that allows their population to explode, or access to new resources that allows them to carve out a niche in this new environment. Why are these invasive plants problematic? Uh, generally speaking, it's because of the ecological damage that they can cause, as well as some infrastructural risks from a human perspective. So they can harm other organisms. 
Invasive plants are capable, especially invasive aquatics, are capable of creating hypoxic environments, uh, low light situations where the plants grow and then they block out sunlight from reaching other plants. Uh, and then both of these two things can end up causing starvation for animals that live in the system. I think in terms of aquatics, if you have an environment where you change the oxygen content, you now don't have as many plants that you used to before on lower levels of the food chain, that can be catastrophic for organisms that are a little bit further up. Uh, plants can actually alter water chemistry, uh, so they can disrupt nutrient cycles, uh, they can change oxygen concentrations, dissolved oxygen, uh, and they can interrupt nitrogen as well, uh, and they can physically block the water. So this is altering habitats for native species. This generally looks something like what I described with the low light situation where they're blocking off the surface. They can just be very disruptive in terms of a large quantity of vegetative matter where there wasn't before that makes it more difficult to navigate the environment. And because of this, they can also disrupt human water use. So uh, think in terms of a lake. If you've ever been to a lake that had a very high amount of vegetative matter in it, if there were a lot of plants, especially in the shallows, it sort of makes you think twice about wanting to do recreational activities like fishing or boating or even getting in the water and swimming yourself. Uh, and then it can also form issues on a larger scale in terms of uh, impacting the economy by disrupting things like shipping. So some examples of aquatics, specifically aquatic invasives, because that's what I like to focus on that we actually see in Texas and surrounding states. Uh, alligator weed, so Alternanthera phylloxeroides. This is something that I worked with during my undergrad as well as hydrilla. Uh, it actually looks pretty similar, as you'll see soon. Uh, problem with forming dense mats on the surface of the water. Water hyacinth, uh, unfortunately, it's a rather pretty plant, but this one is also extremely disruptive to the ecosystems that it's introduced to. Uh, and then giant salvinia. This is one that a lot of people very easily recognize because of just how distinguish its characteristics are, how unique it looks. Uh, and then hydrilla. So hydrilla is the species that I've been working with primarily for the past four years now. This is a image of actually a collection taken from the torch portal, the Brit Herbarium. This is what hydrilla, hydrilla looks like after it's been mounted. So it's a freshwater aquatic invasive, and it was introduced to the United States as an aquarium plant in the 1950s. That first introduction actually took place in the state of Florida. And it is characterized by its world appearance and also its resilience. So it's very similar in how it looks physically to other common invasive aquatics like Elodia, if you've ever seen Elodia and alligator weed as well. Uh, but a little bit of a unique trait about it is just how resilient it actually is. And I'll go into why that is later. So now that we know what hydrilla is, why is it problematic? How does it actually cause negative impacts? So big one is blocking waterways. So as you can see here, it can become very densely packed and it can get caught up in things like boats inhibiting movement. Uh, it's actually a species of concern by the US Army Corps of Engineers primarily because of its infrastructural impacts. In addition to blocking boats and shipping, it actually gets so bad that it can disrupt hydroelectric power generation by impacting dams. Uh, it provides a massive amount of shade when it forms these gigantic uh, clusters up on the surface. That is problematic for the organisms living in the system because it can cause a food chain collapse if there were plants lower than the hydrilla or that are outcompeted by the hydrilla that were sort of carrying that ecosystem. And then it also is documented as reducing dissolved oxygen in systems. Uh, generally speaking, these effects are a net negative. What I mean by that is there have been some species of fish that have been documented to do better in environments where hydrilla are introduced. Uh, I've actually heard of some people who are in charge of fish management and game management who like when hydrilla is introduced into certain waterways because it changes uh, what fish function in that environment. But generally speaking, hydrilla introductions are viewed as a net negative to whatever system they're in because all of these downsides outweigh the fact that it can change the fish structure favorably. So before going into more about hydrilla, I want to talk about a few key terms being the different biotypes for hydrilla as well as where they're found. Uh, so hydrilla has three different biotypes in the United States. Uh, it was introduced at least three separate times since that first introduction in Florida. And we know this because there are three different biotypes or lineages that are genetically distinct and found within the United States. So there's a monoecious biotype, a dioecious biotype, and this clade C biotype. So monoecious means that there are male and female parts essentially on the same plant. Dioecious is that there would be separate male and female plants in a population. Uh, and clade C, we just refer to separately because it is genetically distinct from the others and has a very different range. So 
They also have little subspecies names under them. This is a relatively recent development. There was this paper down here by Tippery. Uh, it was actually put out by the Brit Press in 2023, I think, uh, which actually applied subspecies classification names to what we've been referring to as biotypes for the past few years. So the Monetius uh, got Peregrina, the Dioecious verticillata, and Clade C. Lepoinica. So the native locations for each of these, the Monetius are found in South Korea, generally speaking. That's where we believe our Monetius plants were introduced from. The dioecious plants, we believe, came from Sri Lanka, though they have a pretty wide range. And then the clade C plants uh, come from northern China, but their range stretches as far north as Siberia, so they're much more cold tolerant than hydrilla traditionally can be. In terms of where these plants are found within the United States, the monetious plants primarily make up the distribution in the northern U.S., the dioecious make up the southern U.S., and the clade C plants are thankfully confined to just the Connecticut River. That's where they were introduced. Uh, managers have done a very good job of stopping the plant from spreading beyond that point. So here's just a USGS range map of hydrilla. You can see that most of it is populating like the east coast, the southeast. Uh, pretty much all of Florida is covered by hydrilla at this point. This makes sense given that it's where it was introduced. It's been here the longest. Uh, additionally, you can see that there's actually a pretty good amount of Texas covered by hydrilla at this point. It has ended up creeping into here. Uh, up along the East Coast. And then there's also some outliers over here on the West. And here are samples from our lab. So we've had samples sent in by a lot of different people over a long period of time. I'm working with some samples that are 10, 15 years old and some samples that have been sent in a couple of months ago. So this graph is showing essentially just where the different biotypes are and that aligns with what we expect to see. So the dioecious plants, you can see mostly populate the Southern US with some exceptions. The monetious plants are generally the more northern states, and then the clade C plants are stuck in their little cluster on the Connecticut River. One little outlier that's kind of fun to talk about is this cluster of dioecious plants over in the northwest. Uh, this actually, I don't know how they got there initially, but they're able to survive here because of geothermal springs in the area. So it creates a much warmer environment that's more favorable for the normally warm climate dioecious hydrilla. Uh, so next I want to go into talking about hydrilla control methods. Uh, now that we know that hydrilla is a problem, these are the ways that we actually manage hydrilla. So the first of the three strategies I want to talk about is actual mechanical removal. So this is the process of going in, either manually sending people in, which is a little bit inefficient, that's just like the most basic way you can do this, or actually using larger machines like cutters and rakes to physically remove the plant from the water. There's a few problems with this strategy. It's nice because it's very straightforward. Uh, there's not too much complexity to sending people in with machines and scooping stuff out of the water, but it becomes problematic because it takes time to do that. It can take days, weeks, depending on what type of body of water you're addressing. Uh, additionally, it takes people. You need manpower to actually go through with this process. Uh, and then there are some actual problems with hydrilla specifically. So I mentioned earlier that hydrilla is pretty hardy. Uh, it's a relatively resilient plant. This in part comes from the fact that it has some weird reproductive strategies and the ability to stick around in a system far longer than we would like. So the first of these is fragmentation. Uh, this is a form of asexual reproduction in which the hydrilla plants, essentially, they get disrupted in some way. And what we is these little vegetative masses, these stems are broken apart, and then they grow into entirely new clones of the initial plant. So you can see sort of the problem with mechanical removal there is if you're not effectively trained at removing it and you're just breaking the plant up, you'll actually make the problem worse than it initially was when all of these new little fragments of hydrilla grow into entirely new plants. Another problem is turians and tubers. So hydrilla, another problem with this plant is that it has some very resilient strategies for surviving outside of just the traditional vegetative structure that we see, can actually bury segments of itself in the sediment, and then these can survive over winter, through chemical treatments, through mechanical removal. It's especially problematic with mechanical removal because it's very difficult to get pieces of the plant that are embedded in the sediment out. So the next strategy I want to talk about is biological control methods. So this is an interesting form of removal where the general idea is you're taking something that can eat or deal with an invasive species in some way from its native range and introducing it into the location where you're trying to deal with it. So in this case, an example that we have for hydrilla are the triploid grass carp. These grass carp do eat hydrilla, 
uh, not always, it's not the only thing that they'll eat, but they will somewhat preferentially eat it. They're generally speaking pretty effective at dealing with hydrilla, though it can take a good amount of time. And what's interesting about these triploid grass carp is that when you're when you're doing biological control, there's a couple of issues in terms of how you actually decide on your candidate species to use. You have to find something that you will believe not only can control the, uh, in this case, aquatic plant, but also something that won't explode and become the next big problem. You don't want to introduce a fish into the system to eat a plant that then just starts eating all of the other fish in the system and causes an even worse collapse than what you had. These triploid grass carp are nice because they do specifically, for the most part, eat hydrilla, but also because they've been genetically modified to be triploid, they are no longer capable of reproducing, so they can't generate subsequent generations to take over a system. Uh, that's a little bit, oops, sorry about that. That's a little bit problematic because it does mean you have to pour time and money and effort into reintroducing populations of these grass carp over an extended period of time. They're not an immediate fix, and though they do work generally, I've found studies saying that it can take months to years of reintroducing generations of these grass carp for it to actually have a meaningful impact on the hydrilla population. Then we got chemical control. So this might be what most people think of when it comes to dealing with invasive plants, uh, just herbicides. Chemical control is the idea of introducing a chemical compound or an herbicide that is specifically focused on destroying or removing the plant that you're trying to deal with. So I have four examples here of commonly used herbicides just taken from different management websites uh, and some general information about them. So we got bispirobac sodium, copper sulfate, penoxalum, and endothol. Uh, bispirobac sodium and penoxalum are both systemic herbicides, meaning you introduce just a large amount of them broadly into the system and then they apply over time to everything there. They're generally speaking slower acting, uh, they're mostly specific. They do have some problems with specificity when it comes to impacting other broadleaf plants, but generally these are relatively safe around other plants. Uh, problem with bispirobac sodium is that even according to the manufacturer directions, it is not usable in flowing water of any kind. So you can use it in more stagnant water, but it just does not work in high flow environments. Uh, and panoxalum is interesting because it is mobile in soil. So that means you'll end up with panoxalum in places you did not initially intend to have panoxalum which is not necessarily problematic, except for the fact that it could impact other plants in a new environment. And also there are some minor human health concerns surrounding panoxalum. Copper sulfate is interesting. Uh, there's actually a few different copper compounds that are used in, herbicide, or in plant control as herbicides. These are just really toxic in general. They will do a great job of killing the hydrilla, but they will kill everything else in the system. They will kill all of the other plants. They will kill the fish. So it's kind of like the last ditch effort. It's your final option if you really need to get rid of everything in the water. Uh, and then there's endothol. Endothol is a contact herbicide. So it's sort of the opposite to the systemic herbicides where you apply it more directly to a plant and it works on that specific plant. Endothol is generally speaking very effective and fast acting, uh, but one problem Potentially. There's no formal documentation of this, but there's sort of rumors, whispers of endothal resistance becoming a concern uh, with hydrilla populations in Florida. And then there's fluoridone. So fluoridone is the herbicide that's most relevant to the work that I actually do. Uh, it's a relatively specific herbicide in that it's a carotenoid biosynthesis inhibitor. So carotenoids essentially protect the plant during the process of photosynthesis from solar damage. Uh, the idea with this is that you apply fluoridone to plants, specifically the hydrilla, and then it interrupts the process of creating these carotenoids, which means there's nothing to protect the plant during photosynthesis from solar damage, so it ends up bleaching and dying off. Uh, fluoridone is generally considered to be pretty safe under most circumstances. It's not documented to have much impact, if any, on most animals, a few other types of plants. Uh, and it is so safe in humans that I actually found a couple of studies talking about using it as an anti-inflammatory drug, uh, and then a couple more papers or a couple of websites actually documenting it for sale as an anti-inflammatory. Uh, some problems with fluoridone, it takes months to reach full effect, so it is another systemic herbicide. You do have to reapply it over an extended period of time. Uh, and then the other big problem that is more unique to fluoridone uh, is that plants can develop resistance to it. So that's like the main focus of my project. Fluoridone resistance is a big thing. So hydrilla are interesting in how they develop fluoridone resistance uh, because there's a couple of strange things about it. 
So they developed resistance to fluoridone in the PDS or phytoene desaturase gene, which is essentially integral to the process of carotenoid biosynthesis. Uh, there are three different mutations, a CAT, an AGT, and a TGT, that all occur at the same codon in this gene. So there's a little graph chart table over here on the right. Down at the bottom, you've got the CGT wild type. That's what we see as the most susceptible, like this is what hydrilla generally look like. And then there's AGT, TGT, and CAT mutants in order of increasing levels of resistance to fluoridone. Another thing that's interesting about all of these mutations is that they're found only in the dioecious hydrilla. So I'm gonna say something that might seem a little bit counterintuitive at first, but because these are found only in the dioecious hydrilla, it means that these uh, mutations almost certainly arose somatically. So the reason I say that, you might think dioecious hydrilla, male plants, female plants, sexual reproduction, that would result in generations of mutations. But the dioecious plants in the United States are exclusively female. That entire range that's been taken over by female plants all along the southeastern U.S. and then some of the weirdness going on over on the west coast, that is all clonal lineages of the same female plants. There are no male dioecious hydrilla, and all of the resistance that we found so far emerged in female plants from Florida. So that's just a fun little quirk about that. So then I want to talk about testing methods, how it is that we actually approach dealing with the problem of hydrilla's resistance to fluoridone, how we can actually identify resistance. So we've got a few existing methods. The first of them is sequencing these clonal lineages. This is a really lengthy and uh, time intensive process. If anybody here has done Sanger sequencing before, it can be a bit of a pain, it takes days at a time. There's a lot of steps that can go wrong in it. It's just not the most ideal process, though it does work. It's uh, a bit of an investment. Another option is allele-specific primers for PCR. So this is something I played around with during my undergrad a little bit. Uh, when I say allele-specific primers, I essentially mean like strands of genetic material that are meant to bind to the specific region of DNA that we're looking at, to this mutant uh, region in the PDS gene, and then create uh, or essentially replicate during cycles of PCR. So problem with this is that it was really hit or miss when I was testing it during my undergrad. Uh, admittedly, it didn't have all of my focus at the time because I was doing a lot of other uh, DNA extraction stuff between the two plants that I was working with, but we never really found great success with these allele-specific primers. And then their other issue is validation by a gel. So you still have to spend extra time and resources, even though it's not that much, uh, actually just generating a gel using that for electrophoresis to validate these primers. Another option is next-generation sequencing or NGS. This is kind of a catch-all term that's applied to ways of generating genomic data using modern technology. Uh, most common example, I think, is Illumina sequencing. Uh, the general problem with this is that it's very expensive and privatized. So it's really difficult in terms of startup costs to get the resources to actually do NGS yourself. And you can do some work in your lab or just ship the samples off to companies to have it sequenced, but that can run you thousands of dollars for just processing some samples. So with all of this in mind, goal with my project is to design a test that can kind of address these concerns. So something that would be a little bit on the cheaper side, be effective, be relatively fast. And then once I have a test like that in hand, use it to further our understanding of the spread of mutants, specifically in Florida, because that's where we have the mutation documented so far. I can do all of that thanks to this cool paper and papers like it. Uh, so this is titled Cost-Effective and Robust Genotyping Using Double Mismatch Allele-Specific Quantitative PCR. That is the method that I am employing for my new testing strategy. So uh, yeah, double mismatch allele-specific quantitative, er, quantitative PCR or DMAS qPCR or DMAS is how I generally just refer to it. Uh, it's a process of utilizing introduced mutations uh, during the real-time PCR process in order to increase specificity. So the way this generally works is you make two forward primers. So in my case, it's one forward primer that corresponds to the mutant that we're targeting and one that corresponds to the wild type. And then they have a shared reverse primer that corresponds to both of them. So the idea is that these two forward primers, you have one for each of these, and then both of them, when you're running them with a sample, are paired off with the same reverse primer. 
And I'm going to walk through like a very simplified process of how you actually come to those primers, just to give like a general idea of how this works. So say you have these sequences that I just randomly typed out. This is just me keyboard mashing bases. Uh, but you've got a wild type sequence here and you've got a mutant sequence here. You can see the one difference between them is this target SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism. This is where our hypothetical mutation is. So in the wild type, you have a T at this base and in the mutant, you have a G at that base. So your next step would then be introducing a mutation. So what I mean by introducing a mutation is three base pairs upstream from whatever your target SNP is, you are modifying a base pair intentionally to be something else. So uh, things are shifted a little bit, but you have a G up here. The idea is that this G is now going to be a C or a T or an A. Uh, and there are actually papers that go into breaking down what the most effective are. There's different rates of success. Uh, the primers that I actually designed did not align with this at all. I found that the least successful base pairs actually worked for me. But this is just the general idea. You introduce this shared mutation to these forward primers. And then your actual primers would look something like this hypothetically. So with DMAS, they all end on whatever your target SNP is. And then they have to include the three base pairs up, the mutation that you've introduced for the forward primers. Uh, this is probably not like actually representative of working primers. When it comes to primer design, uh, issues that you run into are things like actually getting working temperatures and making sure the primers don't fold in on themselves. So there's a lot more tinkering that goes into the primer design. I just wanted to give an idea of like what at its most basic level it means to have these two different forward primers and how you generally arrive at that. Then these two forward primers would be paired off with a shared reverse. That's the other issue. Once you have these primers that look like they work designed, you then have to find another uh, reverse primer further downstream of the sequence that matches up to both of them. Uh, if eventually by some miracle you get that to work out, then you have your DMAS primers, uh, which is exactly what I did. Uh, so I actually made three sets of primers for each of the CAT and AGT mutants. So what I mean by that is for the CAT mutants, I have three sets of primers where the introduced mutation is each of the other three possible mutations at that base pair, uh, three upstream of the target SNP. So if I had a T there, then I would have one cat primer with an A, one cat primer with a C, one cat primer with a G. I did that for both the cat and the AGT. And the reason I did this for these two and I excluded the TGT is because I don't actually have any TGT positive samples held in the lab. So I really don't have any way of validating their uh, efficiency. So in terms of what I actually tested these on, uh, we have a lot of samples from throughout Florida. The total number of samples in the lab, not just limited to Florida is like 1800 different samples or something. That was the bulk of my undergrad, DNA extractions on 1800 hydrilla samples. Uh, but we do still have a very large chunk in the hundreds that come just from Florida. And a lot of these were brought to us directly by the Army Corps of Engineers. So the Army Corps, like I said earlier, is very interested in Hydrilla as an infrastructural threat. They're responsible for funding a larger Hydrilla project as a whole, just trying to find ways of controlling it. And they put out an open call to get samples of Hydrilla to send to our lab. Uh, they sent most of the samples themselves, but other branches of the military, like the Coast Guard, contributed, and additionally, local managers of aquatic systems who were interested in the project uh, sent in samples as well. These samples cover a pretty wide range of locations, especially in the context of Florida. We're fortunate enough to have samples that cover southern Florida, northern Florida, both of the coasts, central Florida. It gives us a pretty decent range of like possible locations that hydrilla may or that resistant hydrilla may have spread to. Another reason why this range is important is because Florida is the only place where we know the resistant mutants have appeared so far. And one concern is trying to document and track it before it gets out of Florida. And thankfully, we have samples that are taken from those areas with those known mutations that I can use to validate my test. Specifically, the Kissimmee chain of lakes, that uh, location in particular, there's a lot of documented fluoridone resistance in those bodies of water. So what I actually did uh, is I tested the primer sets. Uh, essentially, I screened 
assays with the primers on our known positive controls. I looked at what did best at their effective temperatures, and I decided on one set of primer for each of the two different mutants. So I have one cat primer set that I used for screening the samples and one AGT primer set that I used for screening the samples. And then what I did is I genotyped samples uh, in three to four per geography. So we have a lot of different locations from throughout Florida. I, I wanted to get as representative of a sample as possible of the whole geography in the limited time that I had. So I just limited myself to three to four samples from each of these collection sites with the exceptions of some larger bodies of water. So one example is Lake Okeechobee. That's a bigger lake, more in central Florida. We had over 40 samples just from that one lake. And when I was looking at them on the map, I noticed that they clustered relatively distinctly based off of which coast of the lake they were sampled from. So for bodies of water like that, I separated into, for example, North Okeechobee, South, East and West, because I had enough samples to do that. And it seemed like there could be differences in the populations just based off of the vastness of that body of water. Once I ran all of these uh, on the real-time PCR machine, I get an output called CQ scores. So this is an output of the DMAS runs. It is essentially just measuring the time and cycles it takes for your sample to reach a fluorescence threshold. So this fluorescence threshold, initially the machine just randomly generates it for you based off of your data, and then it will change from run to run. The way that you actually get the data to be useful and comparable to each other is you set every run to have the same fluorescence threshold, and then you can compare how long it takes every sample to reach that point. Uh, what this is essentially measuring is association of a sample with one of your primer sets. So how strongly does the sample associate with your wild type primer set versus how strongly does it associate with your mutant primer set? And these are shown on the two axes. One axis corresponds to each of them. Uh, this makes points relatively easily plottable. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward to uh, plot these. And then when you know what you're looking for, interpret the results. This graph is a bit of a mess because it's just all of my outputs put together on a scatter. I actually have it broken up by the cat primer and the AGT primer, and I'll go through those in a minute. But I just wanted to point out the general idea, and this is reassuring for me having worked on designing these primers, is what you want to see is one cluster up here associated with one homozygote, then a cluster in the middle associated with heterozygous samples, and then a third cluster down here in the bottom right associated with the other possible homozygote. The reason why my data look the way that they do is because we have no documentation of hydrilla that are homozygous for a mutant. Uh, we believe that they are all heterozygous at least. I'll talk about ploidy and copy number later, but we didn't have any documentation leading up to this of any samples that did not have at least one wild type copy in them. So we would expect all of them to cluster either as a wild type or as a heterozygote, so to speak. So here's what my actual samples looked like when run with the AGT primers. So we've got one cluster up here of wild types, a cluster down here of samples that were called AGTs. I want to preface these graphs by saying the vast majority of the positive samples are just positive controls that we ran for like verification purposes to compare them to old sequencing data. What I actually found, thankfully, it's very few mutants. Uh, there were four mutants that were new samples, experimentals that had nothing to do with our previously documented mutations uh, that were all AGTs. So somewhere within this cluster of points, there are four samples that we weren't expecting to be AGTs that we just found in the wild. Here on the cat map, I wanted to include those four AGTs in with the wild type cluster just to show you what their scores look like. Another marker of this test working as intended is that the wild types will cluster up here, but then the mutants that aren't for the primer that you're running will cluster with the wild types. That helps to show the general specificity of the test, the idea that, okay, these AGT samples aren't clustering down here with the cat samples, they're clustering up here with the wild types, because they do have, theoretically, at least one wild type copy. So then I want to go into like the general results of what I did. So moved on to a validation process. Once I actually had all of these scores, I compared the results to another thesis. So this thesis was put together by Daniel Talent, a student in Dr. Williams' lab. The actual thesis was completed in 2012, so it's a bit older data. 
uh, meaning all of my positive controls did come from 10 to 15 year old samples that have been around for a while. Uh, but thankfully, I was able to compare this sequencing data. And then also when I had questions about that, most of those samples, I was able to successfully uh, extract new DNA and resequence them. So in that comparison of results to the talent thesis, uh, everything pretty much lined up except for some cat samples. There were some samples in the talent thesis that were documented as having the cat mutant. Uh, and then I found in DMAS that they were showing up as wild types. Uh, we finished sequencing them again, actually, earlier this week. And we found that all of the sequences that we were able to work with, so there were seven samples that didn't line up with what I had. Two of them, there was not enough DNA left at this point to sequence. They were just completely gone. The other five all lined up with my DMAS results as opposed to the original thesis. So it's possible something went wrong during that initial sequencing process, but it was reassuring to see that those little question marks regarding my project actually favored what I did. Uh, the sequencing that we did was using primers from this paper. Uh, we just call them the Benoit primers. So we took primers that were outlined here for sequencing, and then also I developed uh, internal primers. When we were having some struggles early on in getting the primers to get us clean reads, uh, I came up with some internal primers to pair with these, and then that gave us much cleaner reads than what we had. So then I want to talk about potential sources of error in the project, and maybe I'm not necessarily saying anything went horribly wrong, but there's always room for improvement in the work that we do. So some things that could have caused issues, high degradation of samples, uh, self-dimers forming from there being too much primer, uh, and then also ploidy, which is like the biggest question mark associated with this project at this point. So what I mean by sample quality is we get samples that come in looking like this. They all come in these little bags with silica beads in order to reduce the moisture. Uh, that's a pretty clear, well-defined sample, lots of material to work with from the same individuals who collected, sent in the same shipment. We got this. Uh, it's not necessarily, it could be an issue on the part of the person collecting, but just also anything can happen during shipping of the samples. We do get them sent in. Uh, so yeah, sometimes we end up with things that look more akin to mud or soup in these bags, and it can be a little bit difficult to get nice DNA extractions from them. And then additionally, when I had to go back and do sequencing on older samples, a lot of them are 10 to 15 years old. Uh, they've been sitting in whatever preservative they were preserved in or in whatever container of silica beads for a while now. So some of them were either so brittle they turned to dust when you touched them or were essentially a liquid. Now, self-dimers is the other thing I want to talk about. Uh, so the idea of essentially primers binding to other strands of primer. So... This is something that you can see in DMAS. I'm not necessarily sure if we saw a bunch of that in what I did, but when you see samples that are much higher in their scores, meaning it took them way more cycles to actually reach the fluorescence threshold, out in this range of really 35 plus, I don't have a ton of samples uh, because I excluded some from the analysis when they were giving me really bad scores. Uh, it's possible that some of what you're seeing is due to primers binding to primers as opposed to binding to the actual sequence. We don't really think we had any problems with that happening early on, so it shouldn't have disrupted any of the calling. It just might explain why we have a lot of samples that are sort of further out. You could potentially just fix this by reducing the amount of primer uh, in the mix, and then ideally that should sort out the issue with any self-dimers forming. And then ploidy. Uh, ploidy is a really big thing that I want to discuss because it has haunted me throughout this entire project, as it apparently often does with plant research. Uh, so we are fairly confident that all of the hydrilla that we worked with are triploid. We say fairly confident because we have been told by people at the Army Corps that they are triploid. There is documentation that in these bodies of water, these plants are generally speaking triploid, and they're all clonal lineages, so this really shouldn't change theoretically. But we don't have a great way of testing for that, at least not in our lab. And it would have been a very time consuming process to learn to do something like chromosome squashes and attempt to assess that. So we didn't think it was going to be an issue uh, until we thought about what the actual DMAS outputs look like. 
So it could it could potentially be responsible for the variation in the strength of association that we're seeing in these CQ scores. And what I mean by that is when you look at these samples, there's quite a bit of range. So everything clusters in the general areas where you'd expect it to cluster up here, cluster down here. But there's a lot of variation uh, sort of along the axes. And this could have something to do with the fact that we don't know how many copies of the mutations or how many copies of the wild type there are present in each of these plants. Uh, like I said earlier, we didn't have any documentation of anything being homozygous for a mutant, so we at least kind of ruled that out, and that's why we were comfortable with seeing the two clusters that we did. But we don't know how much of an impact, if any, these samples actually have, uh, or how much impact, if any, ploidy would have on these samples and copy numbers specifically. So like, how would a plant with two copies of the AGT mutation look compared to a plant with one copy of it? And then uh, another point of the sequencing that we just finished up, was looking at this little sample over here. Uh, this one kind of clusters in where we would expect the third cluster to be if there were actually homozygous mutants, which again, we didn't have any real documentation of. This is just one of the positive controls from the cat. Uh, and when I was looking through the initial data, I noticed that there were some things that might suggest that this actually is homozygous for the cat mutant. So we ran sequencing, uh, checked the results yesterday, and there were no double peaks in the sequence. So what I mean by that is when you sequence the data, you get a genetic read. It, it's essentially just showing you what base pairs are present at the point that you're looking at. And what we found was just a CAT. We didn't find a CGT. There wasn't really a G underneath the peak that forms showing that there's an A there, uh, which leads us to believe, although this is not concrete in any way, and we would have to do things like chromosome squashes to sort of uh, actually find the true answer. Uh, but it leads us to believe that this may actually be, alongside the DMAS results, uh, a true mutant, that it is just homozygous for uh, the cat allele. So I'm going to kind of move towards some closing stuff now. So I want to talk about the actual like validity of the test. So we found pretty clear results when we were running the DMAS, which was really nice. There were some struggles initially with some of the other primer sets that weren't behaving super well. But once we finally decided on which primer set to use for each of the two, uh, we got pretty clear results across the board. Uh, one thing that I was doing while running samples was for the first many plates that I ran, I included positive controls to see how the positive controls behaved across runs, and they were very consistent in what their scores looked like. So there's not a ton of variation between runs. And it looks like, generally speaking, we get clear and interpretable reads. It's fast and efficient. So the entire process, once you've got the primers designed and set up, uh, it takes me three hours from start to finish to do a 96 well plate. So it's just like roughly an hour of setting up the plate. If you're faster than me, which some people probably are, then it will take less time than that. And then the machine just takes two hours to do a full run start to finish, gives you your outputs, which are, again, very clear. You don't even have to make the CQ scatter plots that I made. It just also forms like a graph of the curves of the data that it's generating over time. And you can just look at it and see how the curves are behaving to determine, at least with a system like this, what the genotype is of a sample. And it's also cheaper than some alternatives like NGS. Next generation sequencing, like I said earlier, can be expensive. My per sample cost here was $12.26, which is actually worse than it probably is. Because this 1226 takes into account the fact that uh, we factored in the actual cost of DNA extraction. So once we had the samples, getting the clean DNA out of them. And then also the fact that I ran every sample 12 times. So I ran it in triplicate on each plate, uh, just to be as confident in the results as possible and to reduce error. And then the reason I say 12 instead of 6 is because it's run in triplicate, but you have to do in my case, three wells that are for the wild type primer, three that are for the mutant primer. And then that's how you kind of get your curves for comparison. So 12 wells overall for each sample, including the cost of DNA extraction, it cost me $12 roughly per sample. Uh, so some general implications of having this test. So it could, theoretically, I would like to hope, give us an easier, affordable, and relatively effective way for identifying fluoridone resistance in problematic hydrilla. And that would help to make the process of hydrilla management just more doable in general. So moving on to just general conclusions about the project, uh, 
we think it's a pretty highly promising test. Uh, I feel good about how the results look, uh, but it's also not the end. So I wrote up here that there's more room for improvement, such as designing new tests. One thing that I actually did play around with, even though I didn't have those TGT mutants that I talked about, uh, I did design primer sets for them in the same way that I did for the other samples. So if somebody were to provide me, maybe more likely a future grad student in the lab, uh, TGT positive controls, then you'd be able to validate those TGT primers as well and see if the system holds true for that mutant. Uh, and then also there's room for things like potentially changing the amount of primer, uh, actually modifying the master mix that you're using, just influencing the numbers to optimize it. Uh, but then another thing, I just want to use this as a bit of a closing note. So while I was doing all the background research for this work, uh, it led me to the conclusion that controlling invasions like hydrilla, uh, it's great that we can have a test and an ability to identify fluoridone resistance consistently, but that isn't necessarily like a magic bullet that doesn't solve the problem. Uh, ideally, control is probably going to look like a combination of factors. So maybe some mix of mechanical, biological, chemical, possibly using combinations of herbicides together if you're just relying on chemical control. And these combined approaches can sort of simplify the process, make resistance a less relevant issue as it takes longer to emerge. Uh, and with that, I want to thank all of these people. So the TCU Department of Biology for providing me with you know, funding and a place to work. Uh, the CERC grant and the Adkins both helped to fund this project. The US Army Corps of Engineers for providing us with samples. Uh, additionally, a member of the Corps, uh, Dr. Nathan Harms is on my committee, so he's helped me a lot with this. My other committee members, Drs. Williams, Hale, and Jeffries, uh, fellow graduate students, uh, Bridie and Kyra. So uh, Bridie had done DMAS before. Without Bridie's guidance, this would have been a bit of a nightmare for me. And Kyra helped with a bunch of the DNA extractions for this process. Uh, and then also former graduate student, Evan, uh, he's the reason why we were familiar with DMAS in the first place and offered me some help in terms of getting the process off the ground. So that's pretty much everything I have to say today. Uh, so thank you everybody again for coming to this presentation. Uh,